to Shattering Myths. I am Yada. Each weekday we strive to expose the destructive myths associated with religion and politics, patriotism and the media, and military and economic schemes. Instead of merely presenting the news, our mission is to understand what is actually occurring while predicting how these events will shape our world. Then during our second hour we engage God on his terms through evidence and reason, since his is the lone reliable voice in an exceedingly troubled world. We encourage you to participate in this discussion. Over the next two hours, you can call us toll-free, 877-300-7645. Noticed in the news that uh, the uh, Congress wants to bellyache about the uh, IRS uh, probing uh, conservative um, charities, if you will, uh, charity political support groups uh, out of their Cincinnati office, but nobody wants a special prosecutor. Uh, call me cynical, but uh, my um, intuition here tells me that the issue with uh, the senators and the congressmen is that with uh, Americans, uh, uh, particularly those that make donations to their campaigns, taxed to death, uh, and the economy uh, in, uh, in turmoil, and them responsible for the mess that they have created to the U.S. economy, uh, it probably isn't a good idea for them to flaunt the fact that their personal playground is tax exempt. That contributions to, uh, to their campaigns and to all of their personal indulgences are not taxed. I don't think it would go over real well with the American people if they uh, considered that those who are destroying the U.S. economy and who have regulated and taxed it to death aren't very well regulated and simply aren't taxed on their own. Maybe if they played by the same rules, the rules might be different. Yesterday we were covering a story about um, Pope Francis uh, and his uh, uh, potential uh, exorcism. And the one thing I did not explain, and I, I do want to go over, and there's more insights on the particular story and on uh, Roman Catholicism fascinations with uh, exorcisms, uh, but the one thing I promised to do that I did not do yesterday is explain how it is possible that uh, that Christians who have no relationship with uh, God can perform exorcisms. Now, yesterday we read Yosha telling us this would be the case, that Christians who do not know him, calling him Lord, would be summarily excluded from heaven. That anyone calling God Lord is excluded from heaven. That's what he said. And... He had then said that, they, that not listening to him, which is typical of Christians, they repeat Lord, Lord um, to him after he tells them that if you call him Lord, you're excluded from heaven. And then they uh, say, by the way, so much for they, you know, he knows who I'm talking to. You know, you don't get to get so fixated on, uh, on his name. He knows that uh, when I use Jesus, who I'm talking to, well, so much for that myth with uh, the statement that Yosha made in the Sermon on the Mount. He then uh, listens to them say, but, you know, we did, uh, we, we wrote um, and said, uh, you know, inspired utterances in your name. And no, your books and your sermons, they weren't inspired. And you most certainly didn't present them in my name. Then they said, we, we drove out demons in your name. No, no, you didn't drive out demons in my name. And then they said, but we built uh, these mighty institutions and did mighty things that we uh, we created in your name. All, of course, was in direct contradiction to what God's role is relative to our lives. It is God who inspires revelations, not men. It is uh, God who keeps the demonic influence away from us, not us driving them out. We don't have any control over them. And uh, third, the, uh, this notion that we are to do mighty works is the opposite of God's perspective, who is the one who does mighty works uh, to, uh, to save us, to uh, in, um, uh, improve and enhance his relationship with his covenant children. Now, as it relates to the second item in that list, most of the time that, uh, that God speaks of exorcisms, um, and there is none in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, but there are uh, several, in uh, the historic accounts, but uh, most of the time that this is is discussed, it's in the uh, it's in a discussion with false prophets of those who are excluded from him. So, what you have to recognize is, okay, these people do not know God. God's made that very clear. He says, "I do not know you. You do not know me. Get out of here." 
So they have no relationship with him, but they have witnessed demons being uh, expelled, and they have done so. So how did they do so when they have absolutely no relationship with God? How does a Christian, how does the Roman Catholic Church identify and cast out demons when they have no relationship with God? Uh, we ought not be stumped here. The Lord, the very name, the title that these Christians are using wrongly when they uh, approach Yahusha is Satan. Paul, who's the founder of the Christian religion, said that he was demon-possessed. He said that Satan's messengers controlled him. He spoke of the Lord, and his God is modeled after Satan's ambition. So, who is empowering Christians? The Lord. And when the Lord, they even say they're casting out demons in the Lord's name, doesn't Satan have control over those spirits who rebelled along with him? And so, what easier way is it is there for Satan to fool the gullible than to have his demons be cast out of somebody? What, I mean, what does it cost him? It cost him nothing. I mean, this idea that uh, that a demon who is cast out is somehow destroyed is nonsense. Uh, spiritual messengers, whether they be good or bad, um, are eternal. I think. Just go someplace else. It doesn't. He loses nothing, but he gets a great show when one someone who has mistaken him for God is empowered by him to cast out one of his own. But then you might say, what? Well, one of the times when uh, Yosha cast out demons, he uh, he said that uh, that uh, a house divided cannot stand when the question as to how he could have. Uh, power over them because they assume, well, they assumed the logical explanation. Well, the explanation one I just showed you, the explanation, which is that, of course, the Lord has control over demons. They work for him. And so the those who knew the adversarial relationship immediately at that day said, well, you know, if you're casting them out, you know, you, you must be associated with them. The, the logical analysis, the one that Christians can't make here, is one that people of that day quickly made. And Yosha gave a very interesting comment. He said, a house divided cannot stand. And so the inference for Christians is, well, the only way that you can cast out demons is to be opposed to them because uh, if you're a divided house, you can't stand. That is really a clever comment because what he's saying is that, uh, that yes, he has the power to cast out demons. Yes, Satan has the power to cast out demons. But... When the uh, uh, a, a house separated, and Satan's house is separated from God, those de the demonic house is separated from God, it will not stand. And it will. It's going to crumble. And so God is making the, the distinction here that all demonic activity is separated from him, and that ultimately it will not stand. He didn't say it's going to die, because they're not going to die. They're going to ultimately be banished to Sheol, a place that's infinite in time. They'll be incarcerated. And so it was a brilliant uh, answer. He's talking about the difference between him and them and ultimately their fate. And so when you see Satan casting out demons in the name of the Lord, when Christians perform that right, you ought to recognize, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a flashy show. But a house that works against itself that way is not going to stand. That's the, uh, that's the, how we can come to understand this because it obviously is confusing Christians. That's why he recites that that will be one of their three explanations as to why they thought that they were on his side. They just beguiled. They were fooled. Returning to the article, experts say that Francis' frequent invocation of the devil is a reflection both of his Jesuit spirituality and his Latin American roots. Now, it's true that in Latin America, uh, Catholicism is really very different. That's why it's so surprising that the Roman Catholic Church would accept their first ever um, Latin American pope. 
because in throughout South America and Brazil and Mexico and and uh, Argentina, the the old influences of the religion of the Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs, and uh, other tribes still are intermixed within Roman Catholicism. And with those religions, there was a, a significant demonic component to them. And so they amalgamated pagan and, um, and I was going to say pagan and uh, Roman Catholic religion, but Roman Catholic religion is a pagan religion. Uh, but this amalgamation of the unique proclivities of the native populations of South America has created a, um, a really toxic blend. And so it is why Francis has such a preoccupation with the devil. Uh, there is this, also if you read this article, it says that there is a, um, a direct relationship between the weakening of Christianity and the fascination with the devil. Uh, this is um, a, a quote now from Robert Gall, who is a moral uh, theologian for Rome's Pontifical Holy Cross University. He says, quote, The devil's influence and presence in the world seems to fluctuate in quantity inversely proportionate to the presence of the Christian faith. So he's, what he's saying is that is when the, the Christian faith is pervasive and no one is allowed to do anything outside of the the approval of the Roman Catholic Church, that uh, they, you don't see the devil. But when when Roman Catholicism loses its control and there's lots of people that are outside the uh, the auspices of Roman Catholicism, uh, you see the devil popping up everywhere. Now what that tells me, if it's true, is that. While his minions, those um, in Christianity who have mistakenly adopted the Lord, who is Satan, as their God, are uh, in control, there's really nothing Satan needs to do. He's, he's got the world on a string. He's got Muslims praying to him five times a day, and he's got Christians doing his bidding. I mean, he can go off and take a siesta. Not much he needs to do. But when Christianity um, loses its influence, uh, then there's work to do. And our deceitful one is a busy boy again. We'll return to this story on exorcism and devils in Roman Catholicism. <laughs> Shattering Mist. We're considering the influence of uh, the devil in uh, Roman Catholicism, demons, uh, devils, and the popes, oh my. Uh, this um, uh, fellow, uh, Robert Gould, who is the moralist for uh, Rome's pontifical uh, Holy Cross University. Boy, there's a whole lot of, uh, of paganism uh, right there. Holy, pontifical, cross, and, uh, and Rome as well as theologian. Uh, he is uh, certainly full of it up to his uh, eyeballs. He writes, so one would expect an upswing of malicious activity in the wake of de-Christianization and secularization. Now, why would that be the case? You know, if that's what uh, Satan wants, so why would that be the case? Why wouldn't he just be laying back and saying, hey, man, you know, I got the, uh, the secularist now uh, in charge of the world. You know, they, they run most governments. They run um, uh, most universities. I've got them indoctrinating uh, people to, uh, to deny God's existence. I've got them focused on the, on the creation rather than the creator. It's, uh, it's just perfect. I'll go take a siesta, man. But maybe I'll need a sabbatical. That's, uh, the problem with religion is it makes people uh, irrational. Anyway, he went on to say that in a world and a surge in things like drug use, pornography, and superstition, oh, why didn't he uh, say uh, pedophilia? Uh, because I guess that would be hitting uh, too close to Roman uh, Catholicism. Now, why do you think that the devil would, uh, would um, be in the drug business? Why do we think he'd be in the pornography business? Why would he be in the superstition business? Isn't that just people doing what people uh, are prone to uh, to do? Estranged from God? Do you think that 
that the devil is, is uh, so such a micromanager that uh, he's out there uh, saying, hey, uh, little boy, uh, why don't you become a drug dealer? Or, hey, little girl, why don't you become a porn star? I mean, do we, are we really that dense that we, uh, we suspect that uh, Satan is uh, omnipresent and doing all of that sort of thing, micromanaging our world? Is he to blame for everything that we don't like? In recent years, Rhone's pontifical universities have hosted several courses for would-be exorcists on the right, updated in 1998 and contained in the Little Red Book, the right relatively brief, consisting of blessings of holy water. Holy water, by the way, is purely Babylonian. It is pagan. Prayers, something that God does never ask for in his Torah. Not once in his Torah does God say, you know, I need you to pray to me. Never once. And an interrogation of the devil. Now, God doesn't say that we should interrogate the devil. He tells us really we should ignore him. He wants us actually to question him. That's right. Wants us to question him. Wants us to consider the evidence that he's provided and uh, and then seek answers, which means that you're questioning him. That's what he wants. So they've got it all uh, upside down, but that's the nature of religion. And an interrogation of the devil in which the exorcist demands to know the devil's name and how many are present, and when they will leave the victim. (laughs) That's kind of funny, isn't it? So the devil is supposed to be the prince of lies, and yet you're asking the devil for a name. What's the odds that if he is the prince of lies, that uh, these demons are going to tell you the truth? And if you're having to ask them to leave, and you're saying, hey, when would you, are you considering leaving? (laughs) Doesn't that suggest that you have absolutely no influence over them? You ask him how many there are, and it, uh, it, uh, it suggests that you don't have any way to tell. Really funny, isn't it? Uh, it says only a priest, of course, is authorized, that is authorized by a bishop, can perform an exorcism. So why do they give classes on it? Uh, and canon law, which is, of course, the church's rules, uh, specifies that the exorcist must be endowed with piety, knowledge, prudence, and uh, integrity of life. You know, there's a lot of Roman Catholic uh, priests and, uh, um, that uh, embody those characteristics. I'm sure that's what they, uh, they all tell themselves as they're molesting little children. The Reverend uh, Guglio Maspero, a Rome-based a uh, systemic theologian, a oh, systemic theologian, that's a fancy term, who has witnessed or participated in more than a dozen exorcisms, says that he's fairly certain that Francis's prayer on Sunday was either a full-fledged exorcism or a simple prayer to liberate the young man from demonic possession. Now, of course, the Pope says, no, that's not what happened. I didn't make a prayer to liberate him from demonic possession, and there's no evidence that he was liberated from anything. All the guy did is slump in his wheelchair. He's still in his wheelchair. There's no evidence that any demons fled him. And yet, the Reverend uh, Maspero says, Oh, having witnessed them, I can tell with absolute certainty or near certainty that the Pope exercised a demon. Now, by the way, the expert said there were four demons and that he couldn't exercise them. We'll be back in a moment. Hello and welcome back to Shattering Miss. I'm your host, Yada. If you're familiar with the role that uh, Goebbels played for uh, Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich, uh, Federico Lombardi has that same role for the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, this article says the Vatican spokesman, the Reverend Federico Lombardi, sought to temper speculation on what uh, occurred uh, or that it was a exorcism. Well, he did not deny it outright. Uh, of course, he loves the uh, suspicion that this uh, pope might have some um, uh, significant influence over demons. He said that Francis hadn't intended to perform one. He stressed that the intention of the person uh, praying is quite important. Um, important for what? The intention of the person is important. Why? And if, uh, if something happened that uh, he didn't intend, what would that mean? He's supposed to be, you know, God's uh, witness uh, here on earth. I mean, tell me he doesn't know what he's doing? 
He doesn't know the consequence of his uh, thoughts or actions. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Lombardi? That said, Francis' actions and attitude towards the devil are not new. As Archbishop of Buenos Aires, the uh, former Cardinal uh, Jorge Mario uh, Bergoglio frequently spoke about the devil in our midst in uh, the book Heaven and Earth. Bergoglio um, devoted the second chapter to the devil and said in no uncertain terms that he believes that the devil and that Satan's fruits are destruction, division, hatred, and calumny. So if you, uh, if you hate, that is of the devil. But God hates. So are you saying that Yahweh is of the devil? God says frequently, I hate. You ha- In fact, it is impossible to love unless you hate. If you don't hate that which is injurious to those you love, you aren't loving. Hate is an absolute requirement for love. Just as choice is a requirement for a relationship. So, uh, um, sorry, hatred uh, isn't uh, one of the devil's fruits. Destruction? Yeah, you know, he's a spiritual being. Doesn't have any physical manifestations. And because he's not a physical being, he can't destroy anything. Sorry, you're 0 for 2. As for division, Satan doesn't create division. He is already divided. That's what uh, Yosha meant by a house divided cannot stand. He is divided, separated from Yahweh. If you are separated from Yahweh, you cannot stand. He is, has been separated. He doesn't separate the rest of us. We do that on our own. Calumny is an interesting word. I love it when calumny uh, comes up in, uh, in, in uh, theological uh, discussions because there is no institution on earth that is more calumnious than uh, religious institutions. Uh, it suggests that uh, the old devil is, uh, is a crafty one, and, and that he is. But his primary uh, calumnious playground is religion, and he has born more calumny in Roman Catholicism than any place else. His quote then continues, perhaps its greatest success in these times has been to make us think it doesn't exist. So he's speaking of the devil as an it, not as a, uh, not as a he, but as an it. I suspect that's uh, possible because you look at the, the Roman uh, Catholicism's uh, view of the devil, it uh, very often sees the, uh, the devil as, uh, as a woman. And there is a... Uh, um, an inference relative to the uh, the devil, and by the way, the spirits don't have uh, sex, but there is an inference regarding the the devil that uh, that the devil will manifest, and we typically use himself as it relates to uh, to um, a fallen malak, because you know, God refers to Halal bin Shakar in the masculine. That's uh, Satan's name. Um, that. Uh, the devil will manifest himself as the whore of Babylon. Uh, whore is a term that we typically ascribe to a, a, uh, a female adulteress. So both concepts are okay. It's just odd to, uh, to hear someone say it as an it doesn't exist. And actually, that is not Satan's greatest success. Satan's greatest success is that he has convinced Muslims and Christians, some three billion of them, to believe he's God. That was his intent all along. uh, This uh, book says that everything can be traced to a purely human plan. So uh, he is uh, also suggesting that the devil made me do it uh, excuse is a valid one. Now, it is true that the devil does intervene on occasion to influence certain people. Muhammad admitted to being demon-possessed. Paul mean, admitted to being demon-possessed. They are the two, they've had the two greatest influences in human history in terms of corrupting people and leading them away from God. And so on occasion, there is no question that the devil does intervene and he plays uh, uh, against people's weaknesses to uh, become the... Um, 
wolf dressed in sheep's clothing to lead people astray. And so we do see his influence, but you'll never see his influence in the wheelchair-bound guy, the pilgrim from Mexico, as uh, has been alleged in this case. Uh, the Italian newspapers also noted that Pope John Paul II performed an exorcism in 1982, in a very near the same spot that Francis prayed over the young disabled man on Sunday. Boy, these boys are way too preoccupied with this. Smiling broadly, another article on the same event says the Pope initially shook the man's hand. But in the South American pontiff's expression, it changed dramatically after a priest from the Legionnaires of Christ, a conservative order, leaned in and spoke a few words to him. With a more serious expression on his face, Francis placed both hands on the man's head for 15 seconds. The pilgrim said to be 43-year-old married man from Mexico called Angelo, then convulsed briefly and emitted a long sigh. His body went limp and his mouth dropped open. Exorcists who have seen the footage have no doubt this was a prayer from liberation from the devil, an actual exorcism. Yeah, I suppose that they blame the devil too for the man's paralysis. The Holy Father did not intend to carry out an exorcism, said Father Federico Lombardi, the Vatican spokesman, and said, as he often does for the sick and suffering people, he simply intended to pray for a person who was presented to him. You know, it's, uh, I guess it's kind of like here the, uh, uh, the fascination with the statue that, uh, that appears to cry, the uh, image of, the, uh, of Mary on a piece of burnt toast that uh, causes, um, uh, and I think it was even one, uh, uh, the image of Mary, uh, the Madonna and child, on a tortilla uh, that uh, causes uh, Catholics to go all a Twitter. It was a real exorcism. If the Vatican has denied this, it shows that they understand nothing said Father Armuth, who uh, claimed that the Mexican was possessed by four demons. So here's the, uh, the, the expert in the subject saying that the Vatican uh, performed an exorcism, but they know nothing, and that uh, the man, uh, this was not an exorcism to cast out a demon, but four demons, and he himself tried to cast out the demons, but was unsuccessful over a long ex exorcism, but the Pope's 15 seconds of unintentional work did the trick. Father uh, Maspero said that it was uh, particularly symbolic that Francis' purported exorcism occurred on Pentecost, an important feast day for the church, when the faithful believe Jesus' apostles received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Of course, this was a Sunday Mass. Pentecost wasn't on Sunday. Nope. But, you know, Roman Catholicism uh, based, uh, you know, Easter always has to be on a Sunday. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're, um, if you're dealing with Pentecost, it has to be on a Sunday. They've got no concept of how uh, if Easter's on a Sunday and Pentecost on a Sunday, that it, you know, it can't be that way. But um, that's their view of it anyway. And so uh, this was really poignant to them because of, uh, of this misnomer that Pentecost applied to the church. Of course, it didn't. There was no church created. There is no church in God's parlance. There's, there's no word even remotely related to church in God's parlance. The Greek word that has been changed to church is ecclesia. It means called out. It is a somewhat um, reasonable translation of kara, which is the Hebrew word for call out, and the mikra, which are based, is based on the verb karar, invitations to be called out and to meet with God. And so what God said on the mikra, which is the mikra of seven Sabbaths, is uh, what is mistaken as Pentecost, is that those who avail themselves of the first three mikra of Passover, which is the doorway to life, of unyeasted bread, which is the means to resolve the issue of sin and perfect uh, us, and on Bukutum, first fruits, which is our invitation to be adopted into God's family, that on seven Sabbaths, the covenant children are empowered and enriched. It's all about having the Mikre conceive the Ecclesia and empower the Ecclesia. These things are related. They literally are translations of one another. 
but by changing ecclesia to church, all of that was lost. There was now more than ever a need for exorcists to combat uh, people possessed by sorcerers and Satanists, Father Amorth said. We live in an age when God has been forgotten, and whenever God is not present, the devil reigns. Actually, uh, God is not omnipresent. So if, uh, and I don't, I'm going to be absolutely certain that God has never been in a Roman Catholic church. But uh, the idea that, uh, that people are uh, possessed by sorcerers and Satanists means that people possess people, because sorcerers are people, and Satanists are people. Demons are not people. Demons are not sorcerers. Demons are not Satanists. And so this boy is sadly mistaken, and he is the chief exorcist right now for the Roman Catholic Church. He acknowledged that many people, even Catholics, regard uh, exorcism as mumbo-jumbo, but insist they are mistaken. Those who don't believe should read the Gospels. There is no Gospels, by the way. It's a, uh, another Christian corruption. Just as church is a Christian corruption, there is no church, there is no cross, there are no Gospels. Nothing even remotely close to a Gospel, nothing remotely close to a church, nothing remotely close to a trinity, nothing remotely close to a cross is manifest in the eyewitness accounts scribed in Greek. And so uh, this man would be as mistaken in his reference to the Gospels as he would be in referencing Yahusha by the corrupted name Jesus, even in speaking of exorcisms, because that doesn't exist either. Welcome back to Shattering Mists. I've got a couple other comments from this article, and then we're going to uh, turn to Glenn, who's called in from uh, Philadelphia. The uh, expert in the Vatican on exorcism uh, said that John Paul II had carried out many exorcisms during his pontificate, uh, but that uh, Benedict XVI had not performed any, instead uh, leaving it to bishops and to priests. Quote, John Paul II fought many times against Satan. Yeah, I guess he was fighting against Satan when he... Uh, he covered up priestly pedophilia so that his priests can continue to ravage young children. Father Amrath said, those battles continue. So even though John Paul is uh, toes up and taking a dirt nap, his uh, battles against Satan continue, according to uh, the uh, Roman Catholic cleric, even though he is dead. In fact, he is present today in many exorcisms. If you cite his name during an exorcism, the per person who is possessed literally froths at the mouth in fury. <laughs> That's kind of funny. That's like saying that the person who is being abused by the devil, when the devil's advocate is cited, the person who is being abused by the devil frosts at the mouth. That means that, that uh, if you're thinking logically, the invocation of the, uh, of the pope's name causes the victim of uh, demonic possession to be angry. <laughs> These boys really ought to think before they open their yap. We have uh, Glenn now from uh, Philadelphia. Good morning, Glenn. Uh, good morning. Uh, um, yeah, I, just, I was going to address um, this uh, exorcism story, which really kind of got into my skin. Yes. I, first, uh, I thought I'd mention you, uh, you spoke of Pentecost, the, the holiday yeah. thing. At yeah. Easter, it cracks me up because Easter is, and encourage, most Christians don't know this, like they know the Easter floats around, but they don't know why. Easter right. is the first, first Sunday after the first ecclesiastical full moon, after the Roman Leap one. I'm right. that has any, anything to do with Yahshua, right? Yeah, yeah, and of course, uh, the, the, the timing of Passover is that God says that you determine the first month of the year by the uh, by the barley harvest, when uh, the ears of uh, of grain and the and barley are uh, are still pliable, still growing, still receptive. Uh, at that point, you you pick the the uh, the uh, new moon. Uh, the uh, which would be not a, a black moon, but the beginning of light on the moon's surface, because the moon was the only way to actually establish a calendar and before we had mechanization on electricity and that sort of thing. And so the uh, the timing is always the begins the new moon that is closest to the time that uh, that barley begins to uh, to become a bee uh, ripe. And uh, uh, and what that does is that uh, it deals with the fact that. 
that the moon phase is 29 and a half days, and so if you uh, just take 12 of those, uh, you, the, uh, the year is no longer going to be consistent with the seasons. So God has a, me- a method to do that. He says that's the timing, and on the 14th day of the first uh, month, uh, that is Passover. And so that's the uh, would is Passover, and then the next day is unyeasted bread, and the next day is uh, Bukotam, uh first fruits. Now Bukotam first fruits is the event that they're actually corrupting to be Easter, but it has absolutely no relevance whatsoever to the day of the week. None. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah, right, so right. They were the Roman Catholic uh, deal, and the, by the way, there's another caveat to the Roman Catholic deal that, uh, that is also telling. It's not just that it's, uh, that it's um, uh, set by this uh, decree that is inconsistent with Yahweh's testimony. It, uh, if Easter should happen to fall on Passover, then Easter is moved. Oh, my goodness. That's, yes. That's what, that, that, what that tells you? That's interesting. Yeah, of course. What it tells you is that uh, that the Roman Catholic Church celebration of Easter, which is the celebration of Ishtar in the Babylonian religion, is, uh, is holy and completely pagan, and that the holiest day on the Christian calendar is, uh, is um, uh, absolutely worthless. Rather than pleasing God that the Easter sunrise services were, you know, Ishtar was a, uh, was a sun deity, Rather than pleasing God, it angers him, and that those who celebrate Easter uh, will never see heaven. Right. That's what it tells you. That's just the pig, yeah, pagan thing is crazy. Uh, yes. About the exorcism, um, uh-huh. I'm, I'm a nurse, and I work with special needs kids, work with uh-huh. like patients, and I was a patient. And I, I saw that video, and it really angered me what they did with that. I mean, Sometimes if you have like a seizure patient or brain injured patient, just you know, physical stimulation or the placing of the hands on the heads or sometimes stuff, you know, it, well, all I saw was, well, there was, you know, something akin to like a very transient absence seizure or something, you know, like it looked to me like that was, you know, neurologically based, just some sort of little, you know, seizure um, behavior or something like that. That's all I saw. Yeah, yeah. Now, Glenn, first of all, congratulations on uh, working with special needs uh, children. That's a extraordinarily worthy uh, way to devote one's life. But second of all, thank you for that uh, insight. I think that's a lot, uh, has a lot to do also with the alleged healings and the shaking uh, on Benny Hinn uh, uh, revival uh, meetings as well. I think you're uh, correct that this is all imagined.